All right, so I think, uh, I think I'll start uh, now. We have many, many people here from all over. This is uh, incredible to see. Ephraim, you got uh, for your lecture the whole world in the palm of your hand. So uh, this, is, this is really wonderful to see. Um, I would like uh, to start with a um, with, uh, formal introduction to the, to the lecture and to, um, and to Ephraim. Um, so good evening, uh, everybody from Jerusalem. And a good day to all of you who have joined us from around the world for this special lecture by Ephraim K. on survivor stories of faith, hope, and resilience. We would especially like to extend a warm welcome to the graduates of Yad Vashem Professional Development Seminars who have joined us, many of whom have studied with Ephraim here on the Mountain of Remembrance in Israel including, of course, Sister Gemma Delutka, who is here with us today. Sister Gemma, it is very meaningful for us all that you are not only attending today's lecture, but also providing some personal reflections on Ephraim's contribution to the field following his presentation. As many of you are aware, Holocaust survivors have a special place in Ephraim's heart. For over three decades, Ephraim has developed a close relationship with many Holocaust survivors. For Ephraim and his team in Yav Hashem, many of the survivors are extended family members. He coordinated countless seminars for Holocaust survivors, supporting their resolve to bear witness and recall their painful memories. In every international conference on Holocaust education that Ephraim organized over the years, and he conceptualized and coordinated, I guess, almost all of them, testimonies of Holocaust survivors have always played a vital role. Our past conferences were successful not only in dedication, but also due to the commitment of so many of the educators who are now part of our growing professional network. Many of these committed teachers, including many of you taking part in tonight's proceedings, have become leaders in Holocaust education around the globe. Ephraim has been honored to work so closely with you, Yad Vashemniks, as he calls you, to promote our common goals. Ephraim is a passionate teacher and a guide. Over the past 32 years at Yad Vashem, he has touched the hearts and minds of many students of all ages across the globe. He has given classes on various Holocaust-related topics, including recently during lockdown, to pupils, teachers, members of the clergy, professors, and lay leaders. On a personal level, Ephraim, Ephraim is scheduled to retire soon. And I read some of uh, the comments of the people here uh, when they wrote on Facebook sentences like the end of an era, or I did not see that coming, or he can't leave, it's gotta be a hoax. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I have to say it's not a hoax. The Friday will be retiring at the end of October after creating a huge <laughs> legacy of education, skills, and spirit. I had the privilege to manage Ephraim for the last seven years as the director of the international school. And during that time, I've learned almost all there is to know about every corner of your heart, Ephraim. Therefore, I am proud to say that more than anything else, Ephraim has become a dear friend. And not because we agree on this or that. In fact, we probably disagree about almost everything. <laughs> not because he's so Only easy politics. to manage. Only politics. And not because he's so easy to manage. Oh boy, was you, uh, you were a challenge. One of, probably one of my biggest challenges in my professional career. But mainly because 
I like your heart, your spirit, your soul, your nishumis. And that is the most precious thing of all. With that in mind, it is only fitting that Ephraim will focus tonight on the legacy of Holocaust survivors, highlighting their heritage and educational messages, especially during these challenging times. Dear Ephraim, on behalf of us all, I thank you for being you and for your work in Yad Vashem's International School for Holocaust Studies since the day it was founded. We look forward to your inspiring remarks and may we all only go from strength to strength. Ephraim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ayal. I think now I can, uh, now I can go home and I have to do the presentation. It was wonderful. Right. Uh, this is a tremendous honor and a privilege uh, to see so many of you as I scroll from screen to screen uh, to see you, to see your faces, to see who's come. Uh, so thank you very much for coming this evening and I'll try and keep your attention. I've chosen for this presentation to talk about uh, three specific survivors and to emphasize three particular areas which I think touch every single one of us as human is faith, hope, and resilience. And thank you. Now I'm on the screen. And by using several of these testimonies, it will highlight not only who these survivors are, but also I think at the end of the day, provide a role model for all of us. So with no further ado, I'm going to the first story, first survivor story is someone that's passed away. She passed away several years ago, Ruth Brand. I know that uh, her family members are taking part in this Zoom uh, presentation. I've spoken to them. And before I show you the piece, I'd like to show you a few words about Ruth Brand. She was born Romania in a small town not far from Sigit. Sigurd is the town where Elie Wiesel was born and grew up. She was born about 30 kilometers away from there. Romania becomes hungry in 1940. And she is at home with her family until 1944. There were restrictions, there were regulations, but her Holocaust story really begins with the German invasion of Hungary in March, 1944. The ghettoization, very rapid ghettoization process in April, 1944. And in May, 1944, her and her family are deported to Auschwitz. She actually arrives at Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 18th of May, 1944. She was chosen, selected to be part of the workforce. Her family members were sent to the gas chambers and crematoria. She was in that camp throughout the summer and towards the fall, the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur fell in September. How they knew exactly when the Jewish holidays fell possibly Jews that came from Lodz in August 1944, but they had some kind of a calendar where they knew exactly the dates of those Jewish holidays. And in September 1944, it's Yom Kippur. And I want you to hear this very moving story of what she decided, her and her cousin decided to do on that particularly Yom Kippur, in Birkenau, September 1944. So bear with me, I'll share the screen. So we're going to hear this testimony together. I will now tell you a little story about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is our holy day of fast, 
the holiest day in, on the Jewish calendar. I was together with my cousin who lives in Haifa, and we decided that we are going to fast. And uh, what are we going to lose? We're going to lose the little bit of um, liquid in the morning. The soup we are going to receive at lunchtime will take back to the camp. And in the evening, we'll get our portion of bread, hopefully with a piece of margarine. And um, so we confess. The SS did know of, our, of the dates of our holidays. And that day, we were working near the crematorium. We were working in the ashes that remain after burning the bones. And we had to place them into little lorries that were taken to different places out of the camp, different places in the camp. And we had to load them. It was a very emotional thing to know that these are the ashes of the bones of our people. And comes lunchtime, and they are giving us our soup, and we sit down. Some of us have not, did not eat. They came from the same area. They too were religious girls and did not eat. And some did eat. <coughs> and suddenly the SS come over and they say, um, we see that you have problems with your appetites. We can fix that. We will help you. Get up. Run. Lie down. Stand up. Sit down. Run. Faster. And the dogs are after us. And if somebody falls down, the dogs are picking them up with their teeth. And I don't know how long it lasted, but it was a long time. And then they said, okay, we see that our help for your, for your uh, appetite has improved. Now you can go back, you can sit down and eat. We sat down and some of the girls did start to eat. My cousin and I sat in a corner, we did not eat. Some of the girls say to my cousin, uh, what is this? Why aren't you eating? She says she's younger than I am, and she doesn't want to eat, so I can't eat either. So they're asking me, why aren't you eating? I said, because today is Yom Kippur, and on Yom Kippur, we are fasting, and I'm not eating. And they say, don't you see? God didn't want us to fast today. He doesn't want our fast. If he would have want our fast, he would have given us better conditions. Not punish us this way. And I say, well, maybe he wanted to see that dafka, which means in spite of it, we are going to fast, and we fasted. 16 years old, and she makes that decision in spite of the appalling conditions, being starved, the work conditions. She and her cousin decide to fast. For her, she saw this as a test, a test of her faith. This is where she grew up, how she grew up, We talk about, in the Holocaust, that the Jews were faced with choiceless choices. That any, any choice they made, at the end of the day, the Nazis intend to kill them all. And you're damned if you don't, damned if you don't. But she decides that they're gonna fast. She made a vow that if she survives the war, <laughs> she will tell her story to anyone 
who is willing to listen. The war was over. She was sent to Sweden. From Sweden, she made her way to the United States. She wanted to come to the land of Israel. She had a, an aunt that was alive in the United States, New York. She went there, met her Bershert, Joe, who was a veteran of a tank a unit of Patton that fought a Omaha Beach and throughout France, Belgium, and Germany uh, during World War II. In 1972, they came to Israel. And since 1973, she's been talking about the Holocaust. Since I first met her in the 1990s, Every time I asked her to come to Yad Vashem, she was always willing. And she tells a few stories I want to relate. And give you these stories. Every prisoner in Auschwitz received a number. And on a number, she had a one and an eight. And she looked at the one and eight, and she said, that's 18. I'm going to survive. Now I want you to know that the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. It's one of the only alphabets I know that every Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. Aleph is one, bet two, gimel three, goes up to 400. So therefore, numbers can make words and vice versa. When she saw one and eight, that forms the Hebrew word. Eight is chet. Ten is yud. And together, that forms the Hebrew word chai, life. And she looked at a number. And she said, they're trying to kill me. They killed my family. But I'm going to survive. And she did. In 2004, Ruth had a very unique experience that most survivors don't have. A closure that she went on a trip to Poland in May 2004 with a group of IDF officers in a project we call Edim Bamadim, Witnesses in Uniform where I was the one that connected her with this particular mission. Because when I was told of the mission and that they were going to visit Auschwitz-Birkenau on May 18th, I called Ruth and said, you have to be in this mission. She agreed. She was the designated survivor that would accompany the mission to Poland. And ladies and gentlemen, on May 18th, 2004. She was at Auschwitz Birkenau with 180 IDF officers. They lined them up in threes. The Brigadier General of the Mission, when they're all lined up before they enter Auschwitz, salutes Ruth and says to her, we are here for you. She walked into Auschwitz-Birkenau exactly 60 years after she was first brought there with her entire family 60 years before. But this time, she had on her right side a Brigadier General of the Israeli Army. On her left side, the rabbi, military chaplain, of the mission, holding a Sefer Torah, the flag of the State of Israel, and the flag of the IDF. She held in her hand six memorial candles, and she walked through those infamous gates this time as a free, proud Israeli Jew. 
there was not a dry eye in the entire mission of those that accompanied her that day into Birkenau. And that was for Ruth, a measure of closure and what she had suffered and what she had lost. Something else that goes to her personality and her tremendous wellspring of faith and her almost unbelievable, unlimited need to make other people happy was May 18th, which is also, ladies and gentlemen, the birthday of my wife, Steffi, who worked at Yad Vashem for 20 years and also directed these international educational seminars. And every May 18th, Ruth Brandt, make a phone call to Steffi to wish her a happy birthday. Where she got the strength to do that, God knows. But she had it. And that's who she was. And the day she lost her entire family, she made it her business to make, to give a simcha, a phone call, in a bracha, a mazal to Steffi. And we thank her for being who she was. Tiyeh neshmata tzorwa v'tzorwa chayim. May her soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal light. Thank you, Ruth, for being who you were. I'm going to move on to the next story. I know we probably need a short space pause between the different stories. But I'm giving you kind of a kaleidoscope from different people from different places. So bear with me. The next story is one I called Hope. It's a story of Judith Kleinmann. Judith was born in 1938 in Venice. Family moved to Milano. Father apparently passed away in the early days of World War II. She doesn't remember exactly. But she had a happy childhood. The Germans invaded northern and central Italy in 1943, when the Allies landed in the southern part of Italy in May 1943. In 1944, the Germans began to round up Italian Jews and send them to the east to death camps, many to Auschwitz. She's five, six years old, January 1944, she held on to her mother everywhere she went, being an only child. It was her mother and her grandmother living together. And she was called, her mother, to the offices of the Gestapo in Milano. Let's listen to her piece of testimony. One day in uh, January 1944, my happy childhood came to an end. It all began when my mother was called to the public phone, which was at the entrance to our building. She went downstairs, and I, as usual, followed her. I couldn't hear what she said, because she whispered into the phone. But when she put down the phone, I saw that she was pale. I asked Mama, why are you pale? What happened to you? But my mother didn't answer me. She went quickly upstairs and she and grandmother packed in a hurry two suitcases. I asked, 
למה? Where are we going? But again, my mother didn't answer me. And I felt, I sensed that something terrible was going to happen. My mama and my nonna took the two suitcases and I took my doll, Angelica, and I embraced her to, to me. We went in silence. After a long walk, we reached a big building. Inside a room stood a Nazi by his desk. He ordered my mother and grandmother to sit on a bench that was in that room. To my surprise, I saw there our Christian neighbor, who also sat down on that bench next to my mother. The Nazi told me to stand by his side. Then he asked me in a regular voice, what is your name? I said, Judita. He asked, with whom do you want to go, Judita? I knew I had to answer right away, and I looked at my mother. But I didn't recognize my mother for a minute. She looked so different, so strange. She looked as if she had a white mask on her face. And her eyes, that always looked at me with love, looked at me as if they said, Danger, don't choose me. I didn't understand why, but I pointed at the Christian neighbor. At that minute, the Nazi shouted something and two soldiers came in. They grabbed my grandmother by her shoulders and pushed her out of the room. Then they went towards my mother. When I realized that she too would soon disappear, I ran to her. But when I almost reached her, the Nazi caught me and held me tight. My mother stretched out, out her arms to me, but the Nazi drew me back. My mother opened her mouth to say something to me, but no word, no sound came out. I cried, Mama, Mama, but they brutally pushed her out of the room. I stood by the empty bench and I knew I was alone. Suddenly, uh, the Christian neighbor came to me, held my hand, and took me out of the room. She told me that she couldn't keep me because she was poor and had five girls of herself, but she would bring me to a place where I will be taken care of. And she brought me to a convent. I want to stop right over here and just take a, a deep breath. She's been telling that story for as long as we were bringing it to Yad Vashem, 2001-2002. I can't begin to imagine the horrific nature of the SS officer telling a five, six-year-old to make a choice. And you have to ask yourself, why didn't they just take everybody? Why put this little child through this horrific choice-making process? Why? And these are the questions we ask ourselves about the perpetrators. We don't have answers. But when you look at the horrific nature of this event, this is one of those events. And I want to relate a story. Jim will remember this story. It goes back to 2005 or 2006, when during a summer international seminar, one of our participants, I can say his name. He's retired, so it's okay. A professor, Bill Dumright from Monroe Community College in New York. Him and several colleagues were taking part in this international summer seminar. He was very, very reserved, very quiet, very intuitive, asking questions, but very quiet. Difficult to see what was going through his mind, his heart. And I'll never forget 
that when she told this piece of her story and we had a reflection sent session afterwards, it's very reserved, wore a bow tie, very proper professor from this university, blurted out, I want to kill those bastards. I just want to kill them. It was something, Jim, you probably again remember, that from that moment, he said, teaching the Holocaust for him had changed, totally. He would never teach the Holocaust the same way as he been teaching it beforehand. And I'm telling you this because this is part of the power of these personal stories. We look in their eyes, we listen to them, we hear the pain. But there's a sequel to this story, which in the beginning, Yudit did not tell us. But as we would invite her from seminar to seminar, and I want you to hear the sequel to the story we just heard after being brought to the monastery, to the convent there in Milano. Mother Superior waited for us at the gate. She smiled at me and she asked me for my name and age. I told her and uh, I said, my name is Judita and I don't want to be here. I want to go home. Mother Superior said, don't worry, Judita. Here you will be protected. We will take care of you. The Nazis won't find you. Then she told me that I was the only Jewish girl in the convent and all the others were Christians and that I wasn't to tell anyone that I was Jewish. I kept it a secret for a long time. As the months passed by, I became friendly with three little girls who were also my age. And uh, I told myself, because the, the, the secret was very heavy for me to carry, I told myself that I could share my uh, secret with my friends because they would never harm me. So one day when we uh, were in the, in the playground outside, I told them that I was Jewish. While I was telling them, one of the girls passed by behind me. She was one of the big girls. And she must have overheard me because she came to me and said, Judita, you are not a Jew and I can prove it to you. I asked her how, and she told me to show her my belly button. I did, and she said, your belly button is pressed in like in all Christians. In Jews, the belly button sticks out. Look for yourself, yours doesn't stick out. I looked and it didn't stick out. But I wasn't quite sure and I told her that uh, I wanted to check all the girls' belly buttons by myself. She agreed that we would both check them. So when the nuns went to pray in the afternoon, she gathered all the girls, stood them in two long lines, and we did a review of all the belly buttons. I passed from one to the other with Marcella behind me, and uh, I was very disappointed to find out that they all had their belly buttons pressed in. Marcella said, girls, we always uh, doubted, we had doubts whether Judita was a Jew or a Christian, but now we have a proof that Judita is a Christian. She is not a Jew. I was very confused because I knew I was a Jew and I couldn't uh, find out how come I had a, a Christian belly button instead of a Jewish one. I hope you're not all running to check your belly buttons. Intuitively, Yudit knew that to bring someone safely in and safely out 
she had to continue that story, which she did in every seminar after that first encounter. She would add this story to give a closure. A year and a half later, May 1945, she spent about a year and a half in the convent. The war is over. She made friends, Mother Superior loved her. And she never knew what happened to her mother and grandmother. As far as she was concerned, that's where her life would continue. May, June, 1945, Two people, Svika and Leah, emissaries from the Jewish agency coming from the land of Israel, were going from place to place to look for Jewish orphans, Jews that had been hidden in monasteries or convents. And they came. She got a message from Mother Superior to come down to her office immediately because there were two people there waiting to see her. She, as a child, thought, my parents are here. And she runs down, only to see two people that she didn't recognize. And here, she had to make a life-changing choice. Does she stay in the monastery, in the convent, or does she go with Svika and Leah, who want to take her to the land of Israel, to the land of the Jews? This was a dilemma and a decision she had to make by herself in 1945. Let's listen to how she solved this dilemma. I told you that she won't go with you. And they said, uh, you did. Uh, you are not a Christian. So you have to be and uh, live with the people that, um, that you belong to. And uh, Mother Superior said, uh, Dita, you are very dear to me. I don't want you to go. Jesus saved you. Under his protection, you are safe. And Leah said, uh, she doesn't belong to you. She was only put in your custody. And Leah came to me and she kneeled down and looked me straight in the eyes and said, uh, you did, you're seven years old, you're a big girl already. So you have to understand, here in the convent, you found a temporary uh, shelter. Now that the war is over, we are going to all the convents and taking out all the Jewish children and bringing them to Eretz Israel. Your place is, is not here in Italy, it's there in Eretz Israel. Mother Superior said to me, Dita, you have to make a very difficult decision. Go to the little room and think over where you want to be. After half an hour, we will call you and you will tell us what you have decided. I went upstairs and I was very confused. I didn't know what to do. On the one hand, I was used to being in, uh, in the convent. I, I was there a year and a half already. I had four girls that were good friends of mine. I had two nuns that liked me and Mother Superior that loved me. And then I said to myself, Leah said that all, all the Jews are going now to, to Eretz Israel. That means that my mother and grandmother are also there. Yes, I will go with them. Seven years old, in her mind, when Svika and Leah explained to her that this is where all the Jews live, well, her mother and grandmother must be there as well. <clears throat> and she decided to go with them. Two people she didn't know. Doesn't know where their mother and grandmother are. They took her, they brought her to Saldino, 
place in North West Italy, there were hundreds of other Jewish orphans, children that were in hiding, were being cared for by emissaries from the land of Israel. And about six months later, she was put in a boat that brought her to the land of Israel, where she continued and grew up here, an orphan village called Ben Shemin. And she tells the story that completes the circle of the belly button story when all the kids, they're all orphans, decide to have an evening where they told each other some of their stories of their past during the war. And Yudi told her story of having a Christian belly button. One of the older girls took Yudi to the side, said, Yudi, please kneel down. She knelt down. She took a stick and knighted her on both shoulders, saying, Yudita, I now pronounce you a kosher Jew. And that completed that circle of that particular story. She finished high school, went to the army, taught, this is the 1950s, taught in Kriyat Shmona, a small underprivileged development town in the northern part of the country. It's where he did her military service teaching young children. Married, has children, grandchildren. She has a book she's written in Hebrew. It's been translated into English. I think it's in Italian as well. And I just want to salute her personally for coming to seminar after seminar and relating these very difficult stories to educators from all over the world. The last story I'm going to tell you deals with resilience. And there could be no better terminology to use when I'm talking about Frida. Frida Klinger, she today is 99 years old. In March yes. of 2021, she'll, yes. be, she'll be celebrating her 100th birthday. We hope and pray that she'll see her 100th birthday and we'll be able to celebrate together with her. She lives in Cholon and you're all invited. Uh, a little about Frida before I show you the piece of video that I prepared. Frida's born in Warsaw. That's where she grew up, went to school. And when the war broke out in 1939, she remained there. She survived the harrowing years, the deprivation of the ghetto. In April 1943, she was still alive, had not been one of the people deported to Treblinka. Her and her sister were both still alive, working in one of the German factories. And she survived the actual revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto in May 1943, like tens of thousands of other Jews that were found by the German forces. They were rounded up and they were sent to camps. She was sent, her and her sister, to Majdanek death camp. She spent several months in Majdanek. And when there was a possibility of being sent, the Nazis needed labor for other camps. They joined a transport, her and her sister, that took them to Auschwitz-Birkenau. She survived the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp death marches that took her from Auschwitz to Ravensbrück, from Ravensbrück to Bergen-Belsen. On the 15th of April, 1945, Frieda was liberated, her and her sister, by the British Army. The piece I'm going to show you is unique, it's moving. But it's also a symbol of what I call, we can all call resilience. Frida had lost her family, extended family. It was just her and her sister. They were emaciated. 
They were hungry. It took them months to recuperate, to get back to their normal physical strength. In October 1945, the survivors are starting to match with each other. And she meets her Beshelt, Romic, very quickly. He wants to marry her. She played hard to get. And they had one of the first Jewish weddings, December 18th, 1945. You remember the number 18? December 18th, 1945, Frida and Romick were married in Bergen-Belsen. Let's listen and see Frida telling us about this very important event. So one uh, afternoon, a Roma came in. He was handsome, very handsome. He wasn't bashful. He didn't take too long. And he right away told me openly so that he would like, like to marry me. So I saw his eyes, beautiful eyes, but very sad. And inside me, I decided to bring life to his eyes. This was very important to me, and I did. Up until about two years ago, Frida was still coming to Yad Vashem and relating her personal experiences to educational groups. In 2018, we had an international conference for Holocaust educators where she came with her son uh, and grandson uh, to participate. We honored her there at that conference and showed part of that video of her wedding in Bergen-Belsen, December 18th, 1945. For all the survivors, the question of where do I go and what do I do was a central question that they were all faced with. For Frieda and Romek, it was clear. They were going to come to the land of Israel, the state of Israel, they joined the Haganah. They fought in the War of Independence. Children, grandchildren. And it's this resilience that Frida, to this day, I spoke to her just yesterday, radiates to everyone around her. When I look at these stories, I see them as role models. If you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, they talk to all of us. Because these are human stories. People that suffered and they took their suffering and decided to go forward and to create. Now I promised these three stories and at this point I'm supposed to end, but with your permission, I'm going to do something uh, very Ephraimish. Uh, I'm gonna add something. Because I wanna add a fourth component. And I think that's the best way to end this 
before I give the reins to Sister Gemma uh, to conclude. It's a love story. So I've taken you through faith, hope, resilience, and I want to take you and introduce you to this love story of two Holocaust survivors. That on Schindler's list, Nachman Genyamanor. They're both born in Krakow. He was 21, she was 17. They were sent during the war to work in the mile factory of Oskar Schindler. He was a mechanic, a car mechanic. She worked in the lathes that produced the pots and pans for the German army. And there were relations between men and women there in the camp. There were about 300 workers in the Amal factory. Uh, Nachum was an avid reader. He had access to books. And it became sort of the lending library there at the Amal factory plant. And Genya relates, she wasn't so interested in his books. She was more interested in him. But he lent her books. They spoke. Their romance developed to a point where Nahum turns to Genya and says to her, if we survive the war, I want to marry you in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim. Why there of all places? Why there of all places? And Nahum's story is fascinating because his family was a very Zionist family and they came to the land of Israel during the fourth Zionist wave of immigration from 1921 to 1929. And his family came, parents, brother and sister, and they settled in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim. He built a home there for his family. That's where he grew up as a small child. 1931, there was an economic depression, a worldwide depression that affected the British men at the Palestine and the father decided to support his family, he had to take them back to Krakow. Most Jews didn't do that. You got out of Europe, you were at safe shores, you stayed there. But he had to support his family. Apparently he still had a business in Krakow, took them back there. Nahum's entire family, father and mother, brother and sister, in 1942, perished in death camp Belgitz, where most of the Krakowian Jewry perished in 1942. When the war was over, as you saw in the film Schindler's List, they went back to Krakow. But I want you to see something before I go any further. And I'm putting the cursor here on this ring over here, which Nahum made for Genya on her 17th birthday within the Mayo factory. It says GW, Genya Volfeider. He gave it to her as a token of his love. And she has never ever taken off that ring. They all went back to Krakow when the war was over. Genya's mother and brother both survived. We were on Schindler's list. He couldn't find his family, didn't want to stay there, went to Italy, got on a ship that took him with illegal immigrants to the land of Israel. He joined the Jewish underground, the Pagliam, and he became a wireless operator on illegal immigrant ships that took Jewish immigrants to the land of Israel from 1945 to 1948. They didn't see each other for the next four years. She remained in Poland with her mother and brother. And only in December 1949 did Genya leave her mother and brother. A few years later, they also came to Israel, but she came in December 1949 to Israel. And ladies and gentlemen, on January 17th, 1950, Nahum and Genya were married in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim. This is their next day picture. They have no wedding pictures. This is a kibbutz, Nahum and Genya, a day after their wedding. In January 17th, the year 2000, they wanted to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary at the most significant place they could possibly think of. 
and they decided to do it at a Catholic cemetery on Mount Zion. That's where Oscar Schindler was laid to rest in October 1974. And we had a group of educators from Australia that accompanied them. They brought their son and daughter and their four grandchildren. And it was the first time I had seen their entire family. And their whole story with the ring that they gave to Oscar Schindler during the film, it's a true story. They actually gave him a gold ring they fashioned from the gold fillings from one of the survivors. And inside that ring, they inscribed a verse from the Talmud, the one who saves a single life as if he saved an entire world. And they gave it to Oscar Schindler. It was right there on January 17th, 19th, the year 2000, that I saw that wasn't just a verse from the Talmud, that was reality. He saved not just 12, hundred Jews, the countless future generations. And one of those future generations is this last picture that I'll end with, a granddaughter and a great grandson. A few years ago, I got an email from Nahum. I love this guy. He has email. He's in his 90s. He's wonderful. Saying to me, Ephraim, we receive we deserve a congratulations on Mazal Tov. We have our first great grandson. My immediate response to him was, did you tell Oscar Schindler? And I got an immediate response from, from, uh, from Nahum. He said he was the first to know. This is who he was for the survivors. And with this, I conclude the stories of faith, hope, resilience, and love to all of you that came to listen and to learn and to be with me on this particular evening. These are my heroes. I hope they're yours as well. And a special thanks to my colleague, Rabbi Moshe Cohen, that helped me with all the videos that I had to redo for this presentation. So thank you, Moshe. At this point, Sister Gemma, I'm giving you the reins of authority. Well, that's something now. <laughs> Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you for that beautiful, touching presentation. Uh, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to remember and honor you as you plan the new phase of your life and work. For over three decades, you have been one of the most active, visible leaders of the Yad Vashem staff in the area of education, both in Israel and internationally. You've been involved in the work of offering opportunities for educators to study with experts in the field and learn updated pedagogical skills and how to use the most modern digital resources. But my remembrance will touch upon your leadership of the summer seminars. We both arrived at that famous center on Mount Herzl in the late 1980s. You had been involved in Israeli high school and Shoah education, and I had come from Seton Hill University with the idea that educators from Catholic institutions should study about the Shoah at Yad Vashem in Israel. Now at that time, the campus of Yad Vashem was sparse, one might say drab, with one building, the administration of today, and that housed archives, library, classrooms, and attached to it was a dark and outdated museum. But you were energetic, open, friendly, and the physical limitations didn't bother you and kept us all close, even in our complaining mood. It was a new kind of experience, and especially with limited facilities, we needed stamina and enthusiasm, and you had a double measure of both, which seems never to have left you. You wisely hired Catherine Berman, who could handle with skill and graciousness the, organi the organizational details. And so together your work grew into very professional seminars. But those summer seminars were hot and for some too short, others too long. Still, you found a way to make them memorable. You always began with inviting the participants 
to join you for the Shabbat, the celebration of Shabbat, a special Jerusalem experience. And at the end, you gathered us all into a group and packed us into a bus for a trip to the north of Israel and the educational visit to the Ghetto Fighters Museum. During those years, as the summer seminars developed, so did the campus of Yad Vashem, and it grew from that one building plus museum to the sprawling, beautiful campus of today, with impressive museum, world-class library and archives, and modern buildings with smart classrooms. Programs grew in number and content, oh my, along sure. with international conferences that brought summer seminar participants back for sharing of ideas and hearing challenges on how to best present the history of the Shoah. And there developed a special way of telling the story of the Shoah that seemed to culminate, as you pointed out in this very wonderful presentation, in the hearing of the testimony of survivors. In the early 2000s, Stephanie McMahon Kay, Steffi, your Eshet Heil and creative colleague, joined as coordinator and together with a much more technologically sophisticated Yad Vashem staff, you brought new facets of the Shoah to audiences, which had become quite diverse. And the seminars were truly international participants from a wide range of religious, social, and political backgrounds. So somehow, Ephraim, you had more on your hands than administering, teaching. And once the iPhones became common, it was more like a 24-7 job. And yet, rarely did the rocky and often unpredictable situations in Israel touch the participants because we were well protected by you personally and by wise Yad Vashem policy. But that does not mean that there were no struggles with groups and individuals. As we looked at so many shocking, heartrending, difficult, appalling aspects of the Shoah, we began wearing down emotionally, spiritually, even physically, and then came the afternoon with the survivors. And this humanizing of the Shoah brought us a sense of hope despite religious, political, national, and international failures and destruction. Maybe we had met survivors before, but with you, Ephraim, at Yad Vashem, we met them in Israel with their love of family, with Jewish religious traditions, with an openness to us people of all beliefs, or maybe none. And they came to be for some personal friends, and that was beautiful to witness. So Hannah Pick, yes, she was a friend of Van Frank, but she was a survivor and heroine in her own way, along with Tibi Ram and Genya and Nahumanor. And this evening and this afternoon, evening, we add. Ruth and Yehudit and Frida. And at the end of the seminar, you left us with your loves, the memory of a Shabbat experience, a better understanding of the love and people of Israel, friendship with survivors. The once great, the great Israeli writer Shmuel Yosef Agnon once said, People's talk and stories they tell have been engraved on my heart, and some of them have flown into my pen. Paraphrasing this, I would like to say of you, Ephraim, our friend and colleague. Survivors tell their stories, and these have been engraved on Ephraim's heart, and many of them have flown into his teaching and have influenced his deep commitment to survivors. And I would say to all of us as Holocaust educators. Thank you, Ephraim. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> thank, thank you to everybody. Thank you for all coming.